th that's so that's going to very specifically depend on the actual heat exchanger and its flow designs. I do want to clarify one thing. Talking water on these hydronic heat exchangers is talking refrigerant. Like they're directly tied into one another. So it's like talking air to the refrigerant circuit in a, in a split system or an RTU. It's the exact same conversation and concept in theory. So um, don't... I do I do find that we, we tend to think about these things as very separate for for I think just because of our, our backgrounds. Uh, but in the same way, if we were talking a split system refrigerant circuit conditions, you can't have an in-depth conversation about that without discussing the airflow and the airstream. I guess it's critical to that to that conversation. Water is the exact same thing here. They say pressure drop increases across the heat exchanger to the power of two with GPM increases. I've never heard that with a brace plate heat exchanger. Yeah, I've not heard that, Sterling. So I'm not familiar with that concept. That there that may be true to some degree. Uh, I I would venture to say that it that may be true for a particular manufacturer. My gut tells me that that would not be true across the board. The different manufacturers, like it depends on how many plates, the the gaps of the plates themselves. Like there's a lot of variables that go into determining what that flow curve looks like, um, and the pressure drop needed for that flow curve. And so I don't I don't think that that would be that's a that's an engineering level decision that they decide to make when they're designing that heat exchanger more than that is a rule of thumb that everybody follows when i was writing a, the flow procedure in the training program it was actually some of the conversations i was having and i i, I uh, was discussing this with some actual engineers who uh, design equipment and having the discussion of hey like uh, what what are ways to calculate these things? Like what other methods do we have to determine anything if we don't have the submittal data that has the flow requirements and stuff? And their literal answer was, you like there's not. Like if you don't have the submittal data and you don't have the charts you need, like if you don't have that basic information, which is not always uh, publicly available, Unless you've got a, a flow sensor or a flow meter of some kind that you can trust, and that's the other issue with, with flow meters, um, they've got to be calibrated correctly. They've got to be installed correctly. Like, there's a lot of technicality into using a flow meter the right way. And so they're not as, um, they're not as just drop and play as some marketing I've heard will make them sound. Okay, I do want to preface that. You have to be careful. Uh, with those flow meters if you want an accurate reading that actually means something yeah their answer is just if you don't have that data everything is a guessing game and there is no there's no set rules that anybody goes by it's just it's what they designed and that's one of the things that uh, hmm. that's probably one area why chillers are so challenging on the flow side is because they're not mass produced in the same way especially water cooled centrifugal equipment they're not mass produced in the same way that rtus and other stuff is maybe maybe the air cooled and i definitely see we have much better flow data on air cooled equipment that is far more just um uh, copy paste template designs but that's just not true for a lot of these centrifugals and stuff. They they are spec built many times. Now we may they may not be that different from one another, and there are a lot of commonalities, but they're still spec built, and there's a lot of variation that the that the engineer the the team designing it at the engineering level or putting it together in their little software that they use, like. It, it matters a lot what they choose and what parameters they put in. And that changes things quite a bit. And so when we're trying to make precise determinations on flow and calculations, like it's just, that's probably one reason why they don't have generic flow charts. Like we would have an airflow chart on an RTU that they produce uh, hundreds of thousands of at a time. Um, 
it, with with the chillers, there's just far too much variance, and every chart would have to be just way too specific. I mean, you you talk a hell of a book to uh, to make that true. That's what gets me with with chillers. I always struggle because there are so many variables. You got to guesstimate so many things. If you can't you can't be sure about your GPM, then it throws off every, yeah, exactly right. Like that is the, that is the core issue, and it's been something that. I've really, I've re I've put a lot of time into at this point, trying to get my head around and try to find better solutions for us as technicians. Like, what's what's something we could do? What's a better way to go about this? Like, what is what tools do we have to do this better? It is why it's a, the problem that it is. It's why it comes up all the time. Uh, we haven't figured that out yet. We really haven't. If the manufacturers would be willing to give us easier access to those databases, something like that, that'd be great. But they don't have any incentive to do that. Like for them, like there, there's no financial incentive for them to take that path and to create this database so that we third party can pull up our stuff for our machine that they'd really rather work on themselves. I mean, they're internal. They have that database. They're internal guys. Uh, if you work for the manufacturer, you can go in and pull that, that type of information. It's not that hard to do on their side. So it exists. We just don't have access to it. Yeah. I mean, they, that takes in their mind, that takes the, it gives us a lot more ability to service our customers, which means that they don't have an opportunity to do it for us. If you're not already in Chiller Academy, I'd really encourage you to go check it out. Just think about it, right? Uh, this is what I do full time. I, I've I've committed. I've stepped out of the field, committed my career to this going forward. This is what I've always wanted to do, and to be able to educate, help others, and grow, and help this industry take step steps forward. Um, so chilleracademy.com. Like I'd, I'd love to be able to work with you over there. We've got a community page. Uh, every, all the lessons have a comment section. That's what I spend a lot of my day doing. If I'm not working on the lesson material itself then I am in the comments and I'm trying to respond to those as fast as I can uh, in addition to helping you through email and otherwise. So love to be able to work with you. For all of those that are in the academy, y'all are doing some great work out there. Keep it up. I really appreciate the support and the feedback that you've given. 